Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Be seen in a whole new perspective that couldn't be seen without doing that. And so now we get to the fifth step where we share with another human being uh, this list that we have uh, worked on. And there's a great reluctance to do this. Oh, you talk about uh, not wanting to do a step. If you want to see character defects and instincts get in the way, you just talk, check the average AA uh, when you ask them about the fifth step. And uh, you say, how long did it take you to do the fifth step? Oh, about an hour, two hours, whatever it was. But how long did it take you to get ready? Ooh, four years, five years, eight years. In other words, you get you got the fourth step done, but now we're going to go share this with somebody, and there's just a tremendous feeling of, I don't think I'll do this today. This ought to wait a little bit. And then some, you get somebody to start a rumor about, he heard about a guy about 30 years ago who got drunk right after a fifth step. Oh, really? God, I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> Run home and tell our sponsor, you know, the guy got drunk doing that. No, he got drunk from drinking. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Debbie, drank. That was the thing. Okay, well, yeah. Um, and so some of us came up with a plan, and this is in case there's anybody new and you've already thought up um, how to do the fifth step painlessly. Believe me, there's people before you have already thought about it. And the, the best technique of all is to just do your fifth step in front of a large crowd, like an open meeting, because that'll end some, you know, make it even more valid, and you, can, you don't want to bore them, you don't want to keep them there all night, and so you might follow this approach. Ladies and gentlemen, I take my fifth step here. I've worked on my fourth step for months. You name it, I did it. Thank you very much. And right about that time, from the back of the room comes a voice, could you be more specific? No, I don't want to be specific. Oh, why not? Oh, I just don't want to. And that's part. We just don't want to. And I think part of us recognizes if we ever go through with this thing, we're liable to get on the road here to recovery. We're liable to move on into a whole new way of life. And if we do that, we won't have any excuse for misbehaving. And uh, it's almost like I don't want to give up my right to misbehave. I don't know if anybody ever has that problem, but it's like, I don't want to get too good. I mean, gee whiz, what if being good is boring and it's too late to turn back? Just a small minority has that problem, but... (laughs) The inner weird circle we'll meet later and we'll discuss this. Um, But the fifth step is a very um, rewarding moment in sobriety. I brought along the uh, 12 and 12, and I got a page out of the big book, and you know, you often hear about the promises in the uh, ninth step. I think there's a whole bunch of them in the fifth step out of the big book. It says, once we've taken this step, withholding nothing, we're delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to fear that feel the nearness of our creator we may have had certain spiritual beliefs but now we begin to have a spiritual experience the feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly we feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe and then about 13 years later when bill was writing the 12 and 12 he wrote provided you hold back nothing your sense of relief will mount from minute to minute the damned up emotions of years will break out of their confinement and miraculously vanish as soon as they're exposed. As the pain subsides, a healing tranquility takes its place. And when humility and serenity are so combined, something else of great moment is apt to occur. Many AA, once agnostic or atheist, tells us that it was during this stage of step five that he first actually felt the presence of God. And so... 
the reason that uh, this step and, and step nine have produced such dramatic results is that they both involve other people. It involves the sharing um, that we've never done before. And most of us have secrets and we have a feeling that they ought to go to the grave with us. There are certain things that we just ought to keep. It's our little burden to carry on through life, and it's just too bad that it turned out that way, but I've got this thing. And you know what it is? It's like a little pebble. It's just a misstep that took place 10 years ago that we forgot to throw away when it was a little pebble, and we've turned it into a huge rock. And we just walk around with this thing going, what a burden I have. And people are going, why don't you get rid of that? And you go, it's the real me. And what the fifth step goes, it gives us a chance. We suddenly take this photo of ourselves that we've had, and, we, and it's only from our perspective, and we run it through the processing machine, which enables us to see the third dimension of it, and we go, that isn't what I look like. And we suddenly see all of this from outside. And we just start laughing. We go, what a joke. I thought that was a big series rock or it was just a pebble. And away goes that. And we see something over here that we had minimized. And we go, boy, I've really got to do something about that. And it just puts everything in perspective. We suddenly realize we have a much more accurate view. Uh, and it gives us the feeling we can get through that day in just wonderful shape. And we realize the power of the process. You see, what happens in that moment is we, our faith has to triple because we actually see how effective this works. Uh, there is little doubt about uh, the impact of a good fifth step. It is one of the great freedoms that we find in the program of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Instead of trying to be something, we realize that we want to become part of something. And to me, that has been one of the greatest freeings that has uh, set place in me. I was uh, part of that same syndrome that almost everybody is, that you've got to grow up and be somebody. And that can never be achieved in the sense that I was trying to achieve it. it whatever I got, I could just see, well, oh, you still got 50 more miles to go. And when I got there, I saw 50 more, 50 more. And it was very frustrating. And then I found here that my goal was to be part of something. And that was manageable. And it made sense. And all of a sudden, it was um, as if I was reading some musical score. And it all was quite harmonious. And I just had my notes to play. And somebody else had written it. And I didn't have to write it. I just had to follow this thing. And it just sounded great as I went along. I said, isn't this great? I wish somebody had told me this was here before. And it was there all along. I couldn't see it or hear it because my character defects were making so much noise. I would hear a little signal, you ought to go over this way. And then the voice would go, no, you need a woman. I go, oh, sorry. <laughs> Often follow that. And so I could never believe in a power greater than myself. I couldn't believe that there was such a thing as principles that would work because I was not free enough to do it. And so it was alcohol that made me surrender momentarily long enough to uh, try this. The last step that we talked about this morning, the sixth step, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character, um, begins in the 12 and 12 with, this is the step to separate the men from the boys. Uh, I suppose that if Bill had written it now, it would say, and the women from the girls. Um, I like to think about this old minister story that is told in churches a lot about the chicken and the pig that are looking in the farmer's window and the farmer's having breakfast of ham and eggs and the chicken says isn't it wonderful how we serve our master and the pig said hey for you it's a contribution for me it's total commitment <laughs> and the sixth step is very close to that um, situation what it does in the process of thinking about the sixth step, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Uh, it, what it comes by in the first blush, it reminds me of the congressional budget process. Everybody want to reduce the deficit? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, it's like this is the sixth step. 
Does everybody want to get rid of we all your character defects? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Which one do you want to start with? Lust? Well, <clears throat> <laughs> I'm about murder. Let's start with murder. I'd like to give up murder. Okay, murder's gone. Now how about lust? Um, no, bank robbery. Bank robbery would be safe. We all agree with the principle of getting rid of character defects. The problem is when we get specific. And then even when we get specific, we don't want to take such an extreme position. There's obviously been a mistake in the printing of this step. <laughs> We're entirely ready to have God remove most of these character defects. That would, that would be more what, what we ought to adopt, a little moderation. Uh, is what we need. Don't jump on the moderation bandwagon. We don't want to take extreme positions. You know, why do we have to set ourselves up for what is obviously going to be a lifetime of spiritual frustration? We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character means perfection. And I remember a line in uh, chapter 5 in the big book, right? It says something about we, we strive. What does that line say? You can't reach perfection. What is it? Progress, not perfection. And so there's, there it is. Bill wrote it himself. We strive for progress, not perfection. So obviously this step doesn't say, you better read this step too. Because it says, yes, the clear implication of this step is perfection. And so we suddenly have a goal of perfection that we can never reach. And uh, this sounds like, why would I be wanting that? Uh, the 24-hour day book has an interesting line in it, and this is in one of the prayers. We have this little prayer thing that uh, comes out and look at each morning. And one of the lines in there helps understanding this step and the dilemma of this step, and the dilemma of a spiritual program. And the line says, I pray that I may be never satisfied with my spiritual condition. Now, think about that. Why would I bust my rear end and just hope, please, may I be frustrated at all times. <laughs> How kind of a deal is this? Why would I be busting my rear end for that goal? And that's the nature of this step. What, is, what am I trying to do? I think we're caught with the dealing with pain. I think that's what life is all about. We're caught with it, and we have our choice of the pain of growing or the pain of not growing. But either way, we're going to have that feeling because we will always have our instincts and we'll always have our self-centeredness, and the process of life is how much of self-centeredness can you hack away before you finish? And we always know how much progress we're making. And if you bust your tail for a week or so and you're working on this and you're working on that, it's, it's sort of an effort to get started. But when you get into it, it's not pain, it is effort. It's like getting in shape. It's real hard to start with, but then once you've got the thing rolling, it's sort of an effort to go out and put in the little routine that day. Once you get your meeting schedule going and you get these things going and you've made a commitment to it, it seems to roll along. It isn't a struggle every day, a debate over whether I'm going to go to a meeting or not. And then it's more of an effort than pain. Um, but as soon as we relax and we cut back on it and we go, geez, I've been really working hard on this. All life is this way. We put an effort and you take a little rest and you put an effort and a little rest. But when we rest too long, then all of a sudden, there's this thing going, how are you going to sit here? Uh, you haven't made any progress in a month. And it's almost like a spiritual journey is mountain climbing. And wherever you are on the mountain, you can always see another 3,000 feet. And you still can't see the top. So then you climb uh, five more thousand feet. And then you take a look. You still can't see the top, but you can see five more thousand feet to go. And you go, why am I busting my rear end to do this when whenever I look like that, there's still five more thousand feet up there and I'm never going to get to the top? Why don't I just sit here and I'll still always see five thousand feet above me. It'll always be the same. You know why? Because the view is better from five thousand feet higher. The view out this way. And to me, that's what the sixth step is suggesting. It is suggesting that I never settle for the view from where I am because part of me is going to give me a needle. 
part of me is going to say, great, I'm delighted you got us to this level, but I'm getting tired of the view. You've got to move on. And you go, oh, come on. And the more I move on, the closer I get to something that feels real good. Uh, as long as I'm on this journey, I can go to bed at night and say, that was a nice day. It's when I, at the end of the day, I know I haven't moved one bit in this direction of spiritual growth. I know it. There's an automatic inventory inside of me. And you know what I try to do then? I try to shut up the inventory. Well, quiet. We don't want to keep track of this. I don't, want to, I don't need to think about the fact I didn't do anything today. Well, it's a good thing that part of me is in there. It's a good thing there's other people in the program that talk about these things. It is... Um, a great fortune that we have each other to keep moving us along either through example or through prodding. A sponsor giving you this or someone who goes through a serious situation we watch how they handle it in such good fashion and they become a role model or a target and we go, you know, I could get that, I could get that way. And the more we move in that direction, the freer we are of these character defects. The closing story I would like to use on this step that has described it for me is the little boy with the toothache, and I think I've used it almost every time, and um, it describes the dilemma of a spiritual program to a T. And this guy goes at 3 o'clock in the morning, he wakes up with a little toothache, and he's got a ball game the next morning, so he needs some aspirin, and then he'll get his rest, and he'll be, he'll be able to do a real good job. But he doesn't call his mother and ask for the aspirin. He decides to wait to see if the toothache will go away. And so he waits two hours, and ding, rah, 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 and then finally it gets worse and worse. So at five thirty, he calls out and says, "What's the matter? I got two th- oh, here's some aspirin." But now he only gets about an hour of sleep. And the question is, why didn't he just call out and get the damn aspirin immediately instead of screwing around for two hours uh, on the theory that a toothache might go away by itself? Very unlikely set of circumstances. And the question, the answer is that he knew his mother. That's the answer. Just like we know our higher power and we know our sponsor. He knew that if he called her, she would get him the aspirin. She no doubt about it. The problem was she wouldn't stop there. She would go, well, what's the problem? Well, the tooth is hurt. Tooth is hurting? Don't worry. I'll call the dentist in the morning. And he knew that when she called the dentist, he'd get an appointment. And when he got to the dentist's office... The dentist would look in and go, which tooth is this? It's this one right back here. It's hardly hurting. And he's go, that's all right. We're going to check it all out. And while you're here, we're going to x-ray all the other teeth. And then they x-ray all the other teeth. They find 12 other cavities, and they make 14 appointments. And you don't get out of the deal until your mouth is in perfect shape. He didn't want to get his mouth in perfect shape. He just wanted two aspirin. <laughs> and that's our problem when we come to AA. All I want to do is stop drinking. I don't want to become a saint. I don't want to have to try and become a better person. I don't want to try with character building. I don't want to try. And they go, I'm sorry, the only help we got is that. You either have to take that help or do it alone. Oh, Jesus. And that's when we wrestle. Do I want that much help? Do I, do I? It's the nature of the help that we are confronted with. The only help that's available is perfect help. You either get the whole deal or you do it alone. And that's the way each day is. You either want to get the spiritual help involved, your sponsor, your group, or you do it alone. And to me, I'm so grateful that I've been forced to raise my hand and ask for help. Uh, Because life has turned out a hundred times better than when I was doing it alone. At the end of the time, I would remind everybody that we have another meeting in 15 minutes. And let's wrap it up with the Lord's Prayer for anybody who... For the benefit of anybody new, this meeting is uh, available to help you get a perspective on the steps. It's important when you come to something like this or any AA meeting that you realize that the person who is leading the meeting or sharing is just another drunk uh, doing their best shot at trying to share what these 12 steps might be, but there isn't anybody in AA who has the answers. We just have our own experience and we try And I know that anybody who is leading this meeting tries very, very hard to follow the AA literature to the best of their ability. But uh, if you're new and you hear something this morning and you just go, oh my gosh, that's totally unacceptable, Uh, come up and talk after the meeting. Maybe it got all screwed up. Uh, There isn't anything in the program of AA 
uh, that draws such hard and fast lines that it wouldn't be acceptable to anybody. I mean, that's, this program was put together by drunks, for drunks, and they knew that if they had a bunch of musts in here and all kinds of uh, absolutes that you had to believe in or any sort of that kind of stuff that would all take a hike the first week and there wouldn't be anybody to make the coffee. So uh, this just doesn't exist. If there's anything that's uh, where we draw a hard and fast line is we just have found that drinking at meetings um, doesn't work too well. So we generally, that's about it. Other than that, um, the program is a plan that has been done by the people who came before you and you get to look at the results and to evaluate and compare this product with you. And if you find something that uh, you would like to change and if you find uh, the program is attractive and you'd like to get the results that you see here, then this is how you get there. That's what AA says. If you are interested, then these 12 steps is how you get to where those people are that you have met here. In other words, that's the thing that holds all of us together. The one thing we all have in common are the 12 steps. That's what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is. When you talk about practicing the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, we're talking about the 12 steps. This is the basic spiritual principles that um, guide the members of this program. And just to set the record straight, if you're new and you think that one of the things that everybody in this room had in common, and that's why we're all here, was our undying interest in spiritual principles, uh, that's not it. What we all had in common was we were almost going to die from drinking. That's what we all had in common. And uh, we were fortunate enough to get here one way or another. And once we got here, we found out that we had two choices. We could go ahead and die an alcoholic death, or we could try and learn what these spiritual principles were and um, do the best shot that we could at following them. Some of us debated this question for a number of years before making a decision as to which one we would do, and the survivors uh, are here. And um, the survivors and the undecided, I would say that's what this room basically consists of, is those of us that have decided and those that are evaluating whether we're going to go ahead and do the steps. But at some point in time, we find that we do make a decision, and uh, sometimes that's the most important part of life, is finally making a decision. And we see that in our third step, when we really decide to go on with the rest of the program. Um, we learn about inventories, we learn the importance of sharing with other human beings in our fifth step, and we learned um, in the writings about our sixth step that we were talking about last week, we learned the difference between the goals that we may have set for ourselves and what's possible. And uh, there's a line that uh, I've always liked in the 12 and 12 that says, we tend to settle, meaning human beings, we tend to settle for as much perfection as will get us by. And uh, I really relate to that. I, and I remember the uh, first time I got serious about these steps, I remember reading them, and I, I had only been reading them about 15 minutes, and I felt superior to the people in my neighborhood. You know what I mean? Nobody else is into this. Boy, wait till I get through. And then I started thinking about my neighborhood and how much pressure it would put on the rest of the regular people there if I became what this book would make me, you know what I mean? So there was a time when I thought, for their sake, I ought to stay an asshole, you know what I mean? <laughs> such, is the, such is the power of uh, some of our rationalization and instincts to find a way to not do this. And I remember thinking that, yeah, these people, they wouldn't know how to handle someone who was honest and nice and all that. I've since come to believe that they were way ahead of me on all counts and probably still are. And that's always been embarrassing to find earth people that have been practicing these principles since they were in grammar school. It's a very big setback when you come rushing in at age 50 telling somebody you learned about meditation and they go, I picked that up in grammar school. It's been very useful all my life. <laughs> 
you know. But when you find something for the first time, it's very exciting, and very often we do that in AA. And show up at work 11 days in a row. You remember that feeling? You feel like telling people in the office, you know, I've been here 11 days in a row. I've been here 71 years in a row. <laughs> See, what you're excited about, well, for us, we're doing a lot of this stuff for the first time, and it is very exciting, and uh, I think the progress that we make in um, the 12 steps and this spiritual growth is, for many of us, the first time, and therefore, it is quite an adventure and quite a journey, and that sixth step just uh, gives us a view of what is possible and points out that... Um, it's a never-ending process that we will always be able to find something else that needs to be done. And so there's a sense of frustration that will probably always be around us as we uh, work on whatever character defects we may be aware of today. It's almost like as soon as you do some progress on that, it enables you to see others that those were hiding. And then you go, God, when does this stop? Kind of like cleaning a house. Did you ever notice that? You get it all done. And it just gets dirty by itself. It's just, uh, you know, I never figured that process out. You're over here and the table is just collecting dust all by itself back there. And eight or nine months, there's a bunch on there. It's amazing <laughs> how quickly it collects and you have to go back and go through the whole process again. And so it is in, in, in this program. In getting to the uh, steps that we're talking about today, uh, seven, eight, and nine, Humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. The shortest step that we have is seven words long. Um, very simple concept. You don't need to spend much time explaining what we're talking about here. We're talking about the fact that uh, each one of us has come to some understanding of a higher power, whatever that may be. For this, There's 300 people in this room. There's probably 300 definitions of a higher power. Uh, we've all done some work on a list of character defects. We've taken an inventory. We've shared it with another human being, and we've... Uh, spent some time in the sixth step trying to get absolutely willing to uh, clean this list to the best of our ability. So we're coming now to a step that says we're going to ask whatever this higher power is to remove these character defects. And uh, that certainly doesn't need much explanation. You just, in your own way, go about the process of asking this higher power to remove these. The problem is they've added the word humbly to the uh, sentence, and so you just have to go that one little extra step um, of humbly asking this higher power to remove the defects. And for most of us, that was a dead end. In other words, what is the difference between asking and humbly asking? And uh, it stretches the imagination, you know. At least I feel humiliated already uh, that I'm in the process. It's bad enough i got to ask. Now i got to figure out how to humbly ask. And the uh, Bill, in writing in the 12 and 12, he obviously was aware of this particular dilemma. And he writes that humility has not had a good time of it in our world. And he's right. You don't sell beer by promoting that it'll make you humble. <laughs> You know what I mean? You don't have some sort of humble guy just standing there just going, Hope did this to me. And there you are, humble. Um, there are references every so often that this man accomplished all of these great accomplishments or this woman accomplished all these great accomplishments and was humble. You know, it's almost like in spite of this character flaw, they were able to succeed in life. It, it is... And so humility needs a good press agent. That's all I can say, is that it just has never been. And on the other side, uh, we find that we're subjected to the uh, great forces that pride can do because we're talking about a non-spiritual concept versus a spiritual concept. And if you want to leave a higher power out of it, if you want to leave, uh, our, all of the spiritual side of the program out of it, you're right. You can get a lot done with pride. That's how you would get something done on just your own resources. In other words, if you want to 
get 110% out of yourself, then you could use pride. And that's what I remember in the Marine Corps. They'd just go, what about your pride, your pride, your own? You know, I'm just going, I knew, but I'm sleeping in a goddamn hole and it's 50 below zero and you're suggesting it's fun to pack snow around your face. And I'm going, this is awful, you know. And they're going, where's your pride? And I said, I don't know. But I don't like being in here. And they're going, well, you could learn to like it. Think about your pride. And I'd think about it and... Let's stay there. I mean, you know, and it would get you to, there was no doubt about the tremendous power of um, pride. And then we come in here, and they're going, humility, the dictionary definition, absence of pride. So I'm going, oh, I see. So all of a sudden, pride went from um, the top of the list, the head, the uh, motivating, driving force to something that ought to be totally gotten rid of. It seems like a paradox. How could that be true? And I've even seen, uh, sometimes you go and you'll see, I remember years ago, it would have the list of character defects at some of the meetings that were hand-painted by some of the early members, and you'd see all the character defects up there, you know, it'd be dishonesty, lust, greed, envy, rationalization, false pride. Even Pride had a PR man walk in there and cut it some slack. You know what I mean? It, you didn't see false lust. You know what I mean? False rationalization, false, false, false. But somehow, and that's why Bill writes, it's not by accident that Pride leads the list. Pride snuck onto the list of character defects and cut itself some slack. You know, and says, some pride is probably good. And guess what that pride is? Mine. <laughs> it's that last little part of me that says, there are certain areas in my life that I will continue to handle alone and won't involve a sponsor, a program, the steps, or a higher power in. And there's just that that is the condition. And this is what humility has to do with. It has to do with the great struggle that has to take place to get out of the driver's seat. See, we get out of the driver's seat in terms of alcohol. That we're willing to do right off the bat. Yeah, I'm out of the driver's seat. Yeah, drinking problems, you got it. What about the other 7,000 areas of your life? You know, well, I'll manage those in myself. I'll keep this thing. And the process of sobriety is, and during your lifetime, how many other areas of your life can you turn over? And this is the process of actually accomplishing the third step, where we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of a higher power. Here we're coming close to it right now. We're at this stage of humbly asking to remove our shortcomings. It is a question of, perspective of putting first things first. Um, very often, when we think of this particular concept of getting rid of pride, of not having a way, if you will, it sounds like you'll go nowhere in life. It's like if I put my spiritual progress first, then while I'm working on my spiritual program, my business competitor will ace ahead of me. Anybody ever have those kind of feelings? I don't know. Maybe I'm the only weird one. But I always have this, I, I just don't want to let go of this situation out here. You know what I mean? And they're going, just leave that whole stuff over there and take a break and go to a noon meeting. And I'm going, yeah, but during the noon meeting, the phone could be ringing. The guy, the guy comes in, he gets a contract. And where am I? I'm at a noon meeting. A lot of good that's going to a lot of good that's going to do me, you know, to take a break at 10 o'clock in the morning, go out, go over to someplace and meditate for 10 minutes. That'll be the very 10 minutes that they call and, and I don't end up rich. Um, and so that this is the reluctance of doing that. And yet, what happens during these times? This is the most amazing thing. Think about what happens when we're willing to risk this and let go and let God, as the saying goes. We go to the noon meeting, and then we come back, and we're sitting, and we meet some people, and we talk, and we sort of just get our batteries recharged a little bit, we sort of get a different look at life, and we come back, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden we have 
a clear answer to about three problems that have been bothering us for a month. You know what I mean? You just go, you know what I ought to do? Well, we're just getting these little creative ideas like that. Of course, we take credit for them. And, uh, you know, we claim they would have occurred anywhere. But if you'll conduct these experiments uh, and go to these meetings, take these 10 minute breaks here in the morning and the afternoon, we find that our efficiency improves. We find that our creative channels get unblocked. We find we're able to do in an hour what it was taking us four hours to do because we were fighting the world. We were a victim. It was a very competitive situation and our pride was at stake. And we went to a meeting and somebody talked about that and they said, hey, live and let live, just be part of the process, live in harmony, try to be useful. We go, no, wait a that's in, uh, that isn't the way I was seeing life at all. And when we come back with this new perspective on our situation, we have different answers. And we find that those work better. And what happens is, if you ever read Chuck uh, Chamberlain's book, A New Pair of Glasses, he talks about, and this is a man who was a millionaire and a businessman, and he's in air conditioning of supermarkets, to be more specific. And he had been in as a cutthroat business, et cetera, et cetera, and he just started practicing the principles of his program in that business. And um, it was incredible. I mean, just total honesty, never cutting any corners, and just, you know, if I have to go back and do this all over, that's fine, whatever it takes, I will always do the right thing, and just and uh, on paper, his company got real nervous with this policy because uh, if you projected it out, it was just not going to work. And uh, he ended up not being able to handle the business. I mean, it just kept piled, piling in because he was trying to do something uh, that was correct. He was trying to do the right thing. And because of that, all kinds of other things happened. But that wasn't the point of doing it. And so it becomes sort of a paradoxical thing. This is what um, the goal of this step is, is to get all of the things that are blocking out a free and unlimited supply of power into our lives um, on a daily basis. And once that power is, is in there, and you, we get glimpses of this, we get glimpses of peace of mind. Bill talked about prior to, under, to see peace of mind, we thought life was either excitement, anxiety, or depression. It was, it was one of those three, and you just went from one to the other, and you said, God, I can't stand anxiety. I think I'll go back to excitement. And that's why we had to have a party going all the time. If we could keep the excitement level going, at least that was better than depression and keep people around action, stick something in your arm and something up your nose, pour a bottle down there and just keep it moving. Then, because when that stops, it's awful. You know what I mean? We had no idea what peace of mind was. And then we get in this program, we're stopping a lot of that stuff and we, we get real anxious. And there's a great period of anxiety in those first months in AA. You're sitting there with, like this at a discussion meeting and the topic is peace of mind. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're afraid to grab your coffee cup because your hands are like this. And So there are some fun little situations, but those are just the price of admission. And as time goes by, why we do much better at that. So the um, process that goes on in this seventh step, not to belabor the point, but this is... Uh, my, I think the most interesting step we have, as far as I'm concerned, to uh, understand it. Um, there's a word that is written about in this step that we try to hide, try to disguise, but it, it has to be dealt with. And Bill deals with it on about two full pages in the 12 and 12, and it's called pain. And uh, that's where we get there's no gain without pain. And so what are we talking about pain? What is the pain? Well, in the simplest terms that I've been able to think about it, it goes something like this. In order to do the third step, if you think about the third step, made a decision to turn my own life over the care of a higher power. Sounds great, right? Just going to have somebody manage my life. It's just going to be a wonderful concept. In order to do that, I have to go through the pain of not getting my way. You see, I have what I call inside of me my way about things. 
I don't know what the hell that is. I get up in the morning and like something turns on and I go, oh, I'm just waking my eyes like this and I go, hope oh, it's not raining. I haven't even opened my eyes yet and have decided that if it's raining, it's unacceptable. See what I'm saying? I haven't even got moved yet. I haven't even got to the bathroom yet. And I'm making a, a pronouncement about the day. Oh, there's no traffic out there. If there's traffic today, boy, I'm going to... Oh, now I've made a big pronouncement on traffic. I haven't even brushed my teeth yet. And my, this, whatever that is, is firing up and it's just getting up ahead of steam and it'll start going to my... Well, I hope that... South America situation is straightened out. <laughs> <laughs> Still haven't got that bad. They better get that goddamn thing straightened out in a hurry. I'm running, I'm getting close to the edge on it. Well, you know, and some other thing, and, you know, Redskins and this and that, and I've just got an official pronouncement on about 80 zillion things. And what this step is trying to have us do is, don't do that. <laughs> that's all. That's what peace of mind is. That, that's the whole AA program is right there. You remember that old joke where you walk in the doctor and he says, Doctor, it hurts when I go like this. He says, Don't do that. <laughs> so we're down to a rather outrageous statement out of this seven steps. Don't have a way. You know, you go, wow, that's absolutely mind-boggling. What it's saying is the alternative to that kind of self-centeredness on every little issue that there is, it's almost like, well, if I don't do that, I won't go anywhere. You ever have that? I won't be anybody. You know, that's wrong. You've got to try this other side. So what I want to do is get out of bed and get to the 24-hour day book before that system fires off and leave something in there and go, no, today I'm going to try and function on, let's go out and be useful. What are these directions that the 12 steps have? You know, you have to break years of uh, habit pattern, and this whole thing has this self-centeredness and defect, have a force and a life of their own, and one is going to be in charge of that day. Either your instincts and character defects are going to be in charge, or you are. And on a daily basis, we get a shot at it. And every day is a whole different ball game. And some days you get up and you're late and you don't get to read the 24 hour day, but you don't even get started. You just are listening to all these things and nothing goes right that day. Everything is wrong. And the only thing, there is no such thing as something happening right or wrong. Things just happen. We make judgments about them. You know what I mean? When, when you go out not self-centered, big traffic jam, you go, oh, this is one of those big traffic jams that doesn't bother you. You know what I mean? Uh-oh, here's one that does. You know, like, like there's two kinds of traffic jams. There's, there's just traffic jams, and they're always there. It's what we bring into the middle of that mess. We can bring in somebody who is working these principles, or we can bring in somebody who is being controlled by pride. Obviously, pride would not want to be in a traffic jam. And so that is what... How humility has to do with is the recognition of what a struggle it's going to be to get out of that driver's seat and that it's going to be painful, that it just hurts to have generated your way and then have to eat those words and back off and go, if it be thy will. You know what I mean? Hope it turns out this way, if it be your will. Well, I was cutting a little bit of slack there, and um, so there's pain involved. And that's enough on that, because I'm going to not have enough time to get to uh, eight and nine. Um, what happens in that step, it, it further defines what we're going to try and accomplish out of the AA program. It shows that we have a never-ending growth job, and that peace of mind is the ability to be happy with constant change and to actively go out and seek to go through some more change. And when that's adopted as a way of life, then I think what happens is you change your, uh, the word pain into effort, and you just go out and put a little effort into that, and you don't even classify it. When we stop our spiritual program and go coasting along on self-centeredness for six months and then try and get back in spiritual shape, it hurts. It's like getting out of physical shape. Getting back in is painful. Maintaining it is an effort. 
and there's a great deal of difference. It's just a nice day, daily routine. Um, the next two steps have to do with personal relationships. Um, made a list of all the people we had harmed, became willing to make amends to them all, and uh, made direct amends to such people uh, except where to do, whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And since this has to do with uh, people, since it has to do with uh, all the folks we sort of run into in our past, the very to run into in our past, the very beginning process is liable to be a resentment. Um, the instincts go on the defensive. We've got a list of the people, and we're our mind projects ahead to the fact that we're going to have to actually go visit them and we can already see the discomfort in doing that and now we resent the fact that they exist uh, that we even have to deal with this mess and uh, so we start coming up with an explanation of what the problem is and we finally come out with that it's mostly their fault that we misbehaved in the first place and so we've shifted all of the blame back out where it belongs not on us and it's just the basic power of the instincts to try and get us to not have to do anything. Because if the more we do, the less they're in charge. And they really don't like that. There's a self-centeredness that wants to remain that way. And so it's suggested in the uh, 12 and 12 that the best way to start out with a list of all these people is to forgive everybody. Start right off with this entire list that we're going to go about and, tell, and whatever they've done is over. And this will get rid of things that some of us have carried for 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, I remember hearing this forgiveness idea. I thought it was a wonderful concept, and I let everybody off the hook except three people. Just like that, I felt it was such a great concept. I, I just didn't think we wanted to carry it to an extreme where we would be forgiving the unforgivable. You know what I mean? And who decides what's unforgivable? Me. I mean, I'm a perfectly good judge. And in other words, it was absolutely outrageous, unforgivable, terrible thing that this person did when it bothered my car without telling me. I mean, it was just amazing that they would do something like that. Whatever it might be that we decided to hold on to, that can be one of the greatest threats to our sobriety that we have, is to carry that kind of judgment on an incident and never, what we've said is, I am never going to set myself free from this. I'm going to carry this one all the way. And so... This step has a wonderful beginning of suggesting that the first thing we do is just forgive everybody on that, um, on that list. The second thing is to suggest that the goal of doing this is to learn a new way of life which is living in harmony. And harmony and usefulness get to be buzzwords in this spiritual program. We substitute uh, pride and accomplishment with harmony and usefulness that this is the real purpose of our life. The other one was our self-imposed purpose. We decided that the, my goal in life should be to become the president of this company. My goal in life should be to be this. We, we're driven, and we know we ought to be accomplishing something because something inside of us tells us that. What the program is suggesting is we misdiagnosed it. That what, we're, what the real force inside of us is to become a spiritual person and that that is what will bring us peace of mind and not to being the president of the company that we have misdiagnosed our own uh, situation and I remember when the first time I heard that I went wrong you don't know me I, I know myself better than that and what really is required here is $94,000 that's it <laughs> then we'll get spiritual <laughs> Put the two together, you got peace of mind. But you can't get one without the other, you know. And so I had a lot of other conditions, which is to underestimate the power of your higher power. What you're saying to your higher power is, you know, I really believe, higher power, that you and 94,000 could give me peace of mind. And I'm going, I can just hear the higher power. Why don't you try it without the 94,000? I think I can handle it, you know. And we're just going, no. Um, and so it is a... We're underestimating what we have available here in order to stay in the driver's seat. Anyway, the uh, second thing that we're liable to encounter is the fact that we say, harm people? Oh, I forgot to tell you. I wasn't a violent drunk. 
As a matter of fact, the more I think about it, the only one I hurt when I was drinking was myself. Anybody ever heard that sentence? The only one I ever heard when I was drinking was myself. I don't know what these guys who drank at home feed their kids up. I've heard those stories. I drank alone. I went away. Didn't even have booze in the house. Then we talked to the family. Is that true? Yes, he'd be gone months at a time. <laughs> So the harm that was inflicted there was a hundred times more than getting punched out. We're now we're inflicting uncertainty, no money, is the guy dead or is she missing in action? What is wrong? The unpredictability and then when we come in, the things we inflict, the harm we're talking about in the ninth or the eighth step are such things as resentment, self-pity. Take self-pity down to the office and dump it on everybody. Hey, when I feel bad, nobody should be laughing. What are you doing over there laughing? Hey, hey, hey. Come on, boy. If I don't have any money, nobody should be enjoying money. If I don't have a girlfriend, nobody should have a girlfriend. I, you know, that whole thing is just, let's go inflict that. Let's inflict prejudice on people. Let's go make slurs about this and race and religion. Let's make ourselves feel better by putting down the next guy. Hey, how about let's debate the points all the way to the end? Why don't we just uh, be a power driver and just run every little situation? Be like uh, Hitler in your own home. Nobody gets to make a move unless you say something. Or, it's okay, it works. I'm not even involved in this house. I just, I just get my mail here. Go ask your mother. Uh, whatever it is, it's not pleasant to look at because it's the kind of harm that we, that we just didn't think about. But when we look at it, it was there and we had a special talent and that talent was we were able to bring out the worst in people. We were able to bring out the very worst in everyone that we met. Therefore, we didn't think the world was too great. But we had no idea we were causing the world to be that bad. And that's why so often people come into AA and they go, you know, I came to AA, my family straightened out. We stopped doing things that brought out the worst in them. We stopped pushing their anxiety to the limit. We stopped bringing their anger to the limit. And so it is in this step that we get a handle on how out of harmony we were, how out of step we were, why we got these reactions wherever we went. And we got a new goal, which is to live in harmony and usefulness with the people around us. What this is teaching us to do uh, is to listen and to try and understand other people rather than demanding that we be understood. And the um, end of the step that, that Bill writes about is it ends our isolation and leads us into the step that brings us the promises, which I've only saved a few minutes on, but I think I can get through it. The ninth step made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. This again is a fairly self-explanatory step that we're going to go, if we owe people money, we're going to make arrangements to pay it back. In the big book it talks about the importance of doing that or we'll probably get drunk. When you sit around and worry about the money you owe and you're going to run into somebody, a letter's coming, the phone is ringing, you just can't take that. It's just it's a terribly building problem and we're running, running, running from these things. And what it's saying here is, in order to stay sober uh, on some of these things, we're going to have to do something about it. We're finally going to have to pick the phone up. Hello, Acme Credit Company. My real address and name is... <laughs> <laughs> and the best I can do is a dollar and a half a week. And uh, we find out. They go, oh, good, well, I'm glad to know where you are. Uh, that's not the best, but we're going to have to take that. And I mean, all of a sudden, geez, I'm making progress on these problems. We're doing something about them. Um, the list of people uh, is as much as we can remember. It's back even before we're drinking. After we came in AA, it's an all-inclusive list. Um, the only advice on going to see these people, we're talking about making an apology, sharing that we're in the program, and it's not a complicated thing. We're going there, we're just going... I just feel bad about that time I tore up your house. Uh, let me tell you about it. And I'm just getting in the program. I'm just trying to come over here. Basically, it's like you're on my list and I'm supposed to visit you. I mean, you can keep it that simple. You don't have to go into some off-the-wall explanation why we're doing it in the first place. But there's a couple suggestions. One of them is that this is a spiritual program and that 
And these steps are power tools, and we mention this uh, almost every one of these uh, sessions, that we want to stay plugged in to a higher power in order to get these done, and I think no step uh, is this more true than in the ninth step. And the way that I heard years ago that I'll pass on to anybody who is new, if you're walking, you have to go see someone else and you feel threatened by the entire situation. It's some boss you used to work for and now he's up in some corporation and you call and you're going up there and the secretary, yes, yeah. and you're going, oh, geez, I can't believe I'm going in there. And you just sort of sweat on the forehead and all of that. Hold the phone. Start all over again. You know, go back out to the elevator. Get a little card out of your wallet with a serenity prayer and the steps and so on now. Look the thing over, talk it over with your higher power, and take your higher power in with you. And walk up to the secretary and say, tell Mr. Brown, we're here to see him. <laughs> and then both of you go in and discuss this matter uh, because we're not there groveling and scraping around where they're doing the right thing. It may go across well or it may not. We could get thrown out of the office. Doesn't matter. Our deal is over with. We have followed the suggestions of this step and we're up against the, um, more than any point in our program, we're up against um, something that I think teaches us some valuable lessons. What is being suggested in this step is we're going to do the right thing. Now, this step has been put in there and it's saying making amends is the right thing to do in these situations. And I'll tell you, it, isn't so, it doesn't come natural. There's just a um, lot of these people we don't like. And we got a lot of anger in there. We got a lot of resentment in there. We're going to go in there and go, hi, I haven't seen you in 10 years. I'd like to come here to... And it just it goes against our better judgment. It goes against our way, if you will. And yet there it sits. And we are torn between the pains of running away from this thing and doing the right thing. And after we do this, this is where the promises are. And I brought them along to read here today. We'll take the last three minutes or so reading out of the big book. I wanted to start with uh, something over here that says, Sometimes we hear, this is just a quote out of the book, not the promises yet. Sometimes we hear an alcoholic say the only thing he needs to do is keep sober. Certainly he must keep sober, for there's no home if he doesn't, but he's a long way from making good on a lot of things. The alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken, relationships are dead, selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in the turmoil. We feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He's like the farmer who came up out of the cyclone cellar to find the home ruined. To his wife, he remarked, don't see anything the matter here. Isn't it great the wind stopped blowing? It's not enough. It is for a while, but eventually we've got to move on into these steps and make the changes. <coughs> now, let me get to these steps. If we are painstaking, or the promises, if we're painstaking about this phase of our development, we'll be amazed before we're halfway through. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. And this freedom is the freedom from self-centeredness. That, and that's what the happiness is. It's the happiness of not being self-centered. If there's anything that uh, the spiritual program, the entire reward is not being self-centered. That is where the joy and the great freedom. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. Which is a great way to balance that past out. Once we've gone back and seen these people and have made the amends, that's it. We've taken the best shot that can be taken on the past, and it sets us up for the very next step, which is where we live a day at a time. It is very difficult to live a day at a time and drag 1957 with you. As you plot along, plus the one month in 62, plus all of 72, 3, and 4, <laughs> And it's go, I'm just going a day at a time, and people are watching you drag all these things that haven't been fixed yet, and this is the last step prior to being able to live a day at a time. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. And this is one of the most wonderful things that happens in AA. All of those things you feel terrible about yourself, all just being an alcoholic that we were so ashamed of, we suddenly find being an alcoholic is what enables us to save human lives. 
So the worst part of us becomes extremely useful in the context of this program. Our rotten, nut war jail experiences are what the next person listens to. Oh, you were in a nut war? I'll follow you. <laughs> oh, you used to be like this? Oh, good, I'll listen to you. So this horrible part of ourselves that we used to think was just so rotten and everything is our gift of life to the next person. And we see ourselves in a whole new perspective and that feeling of uselessness and self-pity disappears and we see how our experience can benefit others. So there's value to all of that rotten pain that we went through after all. In this context, nowhere else is it valuable, only in this context. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. And that was what I was talking about earlier about in the business world or in the relationship world. We just give up on trying to figure it out, take a break, work on our higher power, uh, spiritual side a little bit. We come back and we suddenly have some answers uh, that, to things that we never had those kind of answers before. And we start to rely on intuition uh, as a way of living as opposed to our, own, our old ways of relying on pride. We will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. The bottom line is pride may be able to take us 110% of our capability, but a higher power can take us a million miles above that. It's like, how high can I fly just with my arms or in a plane? You know what I mean? Maybe somehow with my pride I can actually get this far off the ground. Then we go, hey, that's fabulous. Look at that guy down there. We're at 50,000 in the 747. And we're going, that's amazing what he did. But it's still going to take him a long time to get to California. <laughs> that's a wonderful point. He just proved that he could do that. But, you know, maybe someday he'll take advantage of the power of a jet engine but uh, you see what I'm saying it's a wonderful point what pride can do but it's nothing compared to what a higher power can do nothing it's, no, it's not even the same ball game we're at the end of the time there's another meeting in 15 minutes a wonderful discussion meeting and uh, for those of you Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.